This video is a review of the solutions from the midterm for my current abstract algebra class. So this is probably of most interest to those nine students that are in the class, but if it helps anyone else out, well, that's good too. Okay, so it starts fairly simply. Let's use the extended Euclidean algorithm to solve the following equation over the integers. We have 1739x plus 9923y equals one. On the exam, it was equals the GCD of those two numbers, but it's pretty easy to calculate the GCD to be one using the regular Euclidean algorithm. Okay, so I'm not gonna do this on the video. This is just really a computational exercise um, and it kind of takes a long time and it's not super interesting. There are in fact infinitely many solutions, but one of them looks like this. X equals 3,709, whereas Y is equal to negative 650. Okay, so next up, it's a question about a certain group. And so what is U in? And uh, what I really mean by what is U in is describe this group. Well, as a set, U in is made up of all of the equivalence classes of M inside of Z in, where the GCD of M with N is equal to one. So it's a subset of Zn with relatively prime um, equivalence classes. And then what's the operation? So the operation inside of this group is modular multiplication. I'll just put multiplication though. And we are guaranteed to have an inverse and all of this kind of stuff because that GCD is one from a construction that we did in class. And we use this example of a group all the time. So next up, let's find the inverse of 1739 inside of U9923. Now, this seems really gnarly, but we already did this over here in this problem just in a sneaky way. So let's take this equation right here. So we know 1739 times 3709 plus 9923 times negative 650 equals 1. So we know that because those were, you know, the two solutions for our variables over here. And now what we'll simply do here is reduce modulo 9923. And that's essentially like projecting this into U992. That should be a three. And so that gives us the following equation. One, seven, three, nine times three, seven, zero, nine equals one inside of U nine, nine, two, three it was. Great, but if those two numbers multiply to be one, that means they're inverses of each other. So in other words, 1,739 inverse is 3,709 inside of U9923. Okay, good. Now let's move on to the next. Now for our second problem. Let's suppose that G is a group, H is a subgroup of G, and N is a normal subgroup of G. And then we'll show that HN which is everything of the form little h, little n, where little h comes from h and little n comes from n, is a subgroup of G. And since n is normal, we probably will need to use the fact that n is normal. So let's maybe recall what it means for n to be normal in this little box here. So that means for all little g inside of G, and little n inside of n, we have g n g inverse is an element of n. That's the normality condition. Of course, there are a bunch of like equivalent definitions, including cosets and stuff, but I think this is maybe the one that's nicest to use for this setting. Okay, so how can we show that h n is a subgroup of g? Well, we're gonna do it with the subgroup test. So let's suppose that X and Y are inside of HN 
And then let's recall what the subgroup test would have us do. So we want to show that XY inverse is inside of HN. Recall the subgroup test says something is a subgroup if and only if when two elements are in that set, this sort of object is also in that set. So that was proven and we've used that a ton of times to show things are subgroups. Okay, so now that we know that X and Y are in HN, that means we can write X as H1N1 and Y as H2N2 where H1, H2 are in H, and N1 and N2 are in N. That's what it means to be inside of HN. And now let's calculate X, Y inverse. So that's gonna be equal to H1, N1, that's the X part, and then Y inverse, well we have to use the shoes and socks theorem there, so that'll reverse the order of multiplication. We have N2 inverse, H2 inverse. Okay, nice. Now, notice things look out of order. We have something from H times something from N times something from H. But we want this to be inside of something from H times something from N. Like I said, they're out of order. But we can use the fact that N is normal up here. And we'd like to do that by sandwiching this element of N right here, so this is an element of N, between not any two elements of H, but conjugated by an element of H. So we need H2 to be over here on the left since we have an H2 inverse over here on the right. So we'll do that by opening up this space between H1 and N1, and we'll multiply N and H2 inverse and an H2. That's just a copy of the identity. So let's see what that leaves us with. That'll leave us with H1, H2 inverse. So let's group those together. And then we'll have H2 and then N1, N2 inverse, H2 inverse. Great. But now let's see where all of these things come from. So this H1, H2 inverse comes from H, that's because H is a subgroup. And then this H2 times this element of N times H2 inverse is an element of N because N is normal. Remember, that's the normality condition. So in fact, this is equal to something from H times something from N, meaning it's inside of HN. But that's exactly what we needed to do to show that this was a subgroup. Okay, so next up, let's show that H intersect N is a normal subgroup of H. And recall, we need to do this, but here, like, things are switched a little bit. So the role of N is being played by H intersect N. The role of G is being played by H. Okay, so let's suppose that we have H inside of H and N inside of H intersect N. Okay, and then let's point out where we want to go here. So what we would like to show to get that H intersect N is normal is that H little n H inverse is inside of H intersect N. Okay, so let's see how we can do that. So maybe let's make a couple of observations. So the first observation is that H is in H and N is in H. That's because N is in the intersection of H and N, meaning that it's inside of both of them. But what does that tell us? That in fact tells us that H in H inverse is inside of H because we're combining things inside of H and H is a subgroup. Okay, so like I said, that's our first observation. Okay, so the second observation is that H is in H and N is in N. Well, H is always in H, that's our setup here. But then this intersection can be taken two ways. Either we use the fact that it's an H or we use the fact that it's an N. And here we're using the fact that it's an N. But now, since N is normal, we know that H N H inverse is an element of N. Again, that's because N is normal in the whole group. But now, we'll put these two facts together. 
So these two blue facts turn into the following. I guess we should maybe point out that there's an and between them. That's because both of these observations are true. That tells us that H in H inverse is in H intersect N. But that's exactly the condition we need. H intersect N is a normal subgroup of H. Okay, good, let's move on. Okay, so for our next problem, we're gonna look at something called the torsion subgroup of an abelian group. So if we've got an abelian group G, the torsion subgroup of G is the subgroup of all elements of finite order. So we could write it symbolically as follows. So GT is all elements of G. Like I said, they need finite order. So that means G to the N is equal to the identity for some N, which is bigger than or equal to one. Now let's calculate a couple of torsion subgroups. So let's look at the torsion subgroup of the integers. So that's gonna be all A and Z, where A has finite order. But, you know, in an abstract group over here, we write exponentiation as the repeated group operation. But in the integers, the group operation is addition, and repeated addition is indicated by multiplication. So that means we would have N times A is equal to zero, for some n bigger than or equal to one. Okay, but this is fairly straightforward. Notice if n is bigger than or equal to one, it's not equal to zero. But now we're solving the equation, n times a equals zero, where we know that n is not zero. But that means that a has to be equal to zero. So that gives us just simply the trivial subgroup, the subgroup only containing zero. That's the only thing of finite order. Now let's look at the torsion subgroup of the multiplicative group of non-zero rational numbers. So here our operation is multiplication. So we've got x in q times such that x to the n is equal to one for sum n, which is a natural number, but I'll write that as n bigger than or equal to one. But I think maybe just it's well known among rational numbers that the only things that raise to a power to give you the number one are one and negative one. And that's exactly what we get. So this is gonna be equal to negative one and one. Notice that one to the one is one, whereas negative one squared is one. So that's the torsion subgroup of rational numbers. Now let's look at the torsion subgroup of the multiplicative group of complex numbers. So this is going to be all non-zero complex numbers so that z to the n equals 1 for some n bigger than or equal to 1. And there's a little bit more work to do here. So let's maybe first make the following observation. If z is in this torsion subgroup, then the modulus of z must be equal to 1. That's just from taking the modulus of both sides of that equation and then using the fact that the modulus is always a non-zero or a non-negative real number. Okay, but now we know this means that z is in the circle group. So we talked about the circle group in class. So we've got z must be in the circle group. But what does that tell us? That tells us that z is really of the form e to the i theta. Now we'll use the fact that z to the n is equal to one. Also one is equal to z to the n, which is e to the i n times theta. But e to the i n times theta can be rewritten use Euler's formula as cosine n theta plus i times sine n theta. Now we can equate real and imaginary parts on both sides of this equation, and that'll give us cosine n times theta equals one, and sine of n times theta equals zero. But now from calculus class or something, you know exactly where cosine and sine are equal to one and zero respectively, and that'll tell you that n theta must come from the following set. So it's from the set zero plus minus two pi plus minus four pi and so on and so forth. But that means that theta can be written in the following way. So 
2 pi times m over n. So that's just by dividing everything by n here and then using this structure that we have here. Okay, great. But now that tells us that we've got this really nice description of the torsion subgroup of the multiplicative group of non-zero complex numbers. And that's everything of the form e to the i, two times pi m over n, where m and n are natural numbers. Or another way of looking at it, it's everything of the form e to the i, two pi times a rational number. That's kind of neither here nor there. Okay, so now to finish this thing off, let's really show that this torsion subgroup is in fact a subgroup. Okay, nice. And we're gonna do this by the long subgroup test, in other words, by the definition. So we'll show that it satisfies the three things it needs to satisfy. Let's show that it contains the identity. Okay, so let's notice that the identity to the first power is equal to itself, but that means the identity satisfies this rule right here. So that means that the identity is definitely inside of this torsion subgroup. Then next, let's show that we have closure. Okay, so let's suppose that X and Y are in GT, but what does that mean? Well, the entry fee to be inside of GT is that you get raised to a natural number and you turn into the identity. So that means there exists an M and N bigger than or equal to one, such that X to the M is the same thing as Y to the N is equal to one. But we want X times Y to be in this torsion subgroup. So let's see that with the following calculation. Let's take x, y to the m times n, and then use exponent rules. So that's gonna be x to the m raised to the n power times y to the n raised to the m power, but that's the identity to the n, the identity to the m, which is the identity. So that's what we have there for closure. And then I guess finally we need inverses as well. So inverses are gonna be pretty straightforward. So let's notice that if X is inside of the torsion subgroup, then that means that X to the N equals the identity for some N bigger than or equal to one. But now let's notice that X inverse to the N is equal to X to the N inverse, which is the inverse of the identity, which is the identity. But then that means that X inverse is also inside the torsion subgroup. So those three things tell us that the torsion subgroup is in fact a subgroup. All right, let's move on to the next one. The next problem is about something called the commutator subgroup. So let's say we've got any group G, we'll define, like I said, the commutator subgroup as follows. It's the subgroup generated by the elements of the form X inverse Y inverse XY, where X and Y come from G. And then I'd like to point out that there's some notation here that we won't use, but is used sometimes. And that is bracket XY is defined to be this X inverse Y inverse XY. This is somehow some sort of measurement of how far X and Y are from commuting with each other. Okay, so let's start off by showing that this commutator subgroup G prime is in fact a normal subgroup. So in order to be a normal subgroup, you first have to be a subgroup. So let's maybe first show that it's a subgroup. And we'll do that with the subgroup test. So let's take A and B inside of G prime. And then recall in order to use the subgroup test, we want to show that A, B inverse is inside of G prime. Okay, but G prime is generated by elements of this form. So that tells us immediately how we can write A and B. So notice A can be written as X1 inverse, Y1 inverse, X1, Y1, multiplied all the way up to Xn inverse, Yn inverse, Xn, Yn. So that's what it means to be generated by elements like this. It's just a product 
of a bunch of elements like this. And by product, I mean group operation here. Okay, and then B is similar. So we've used X and Y, so maybe we use Z and W. So we have Z1 inverse, W1 inverse, and then Z1, W1, and then all the way up to Zn inverse, Wn inverse, uh, Zn and Wn. Great. And now maybe just as a side calculation, let's calculate B inverse. But let's maybe do even a smaller side calculation first. So let's notice the following. So let's take G inverse, H inverse, G, H, and then find the inverse of that. So that's like one of these portions of this product. So notice by the shoes and socks theorem, we'll invert everything and then reverse the order of multiplication. So that'll give us H inverse, G inverse, and then H, G. Like I said, we've got to reverse the order of multiplication and then invert everything. So reading backwards, H inverse, G inverse, H, G. Okay, good. But now we've pretty much got it. So let's look at this calculation which finishes it off. So A, B inverse will be equal to, well I can write all of this out. I have X1 inverse, Y1 inverse, X1, Y1, all the way up to Xn inverse, Yn inverse, Xn, Yn. And then B inverse will start by reversing the order of the product of all of these chunks and then inverting them as well. So that means first on the left will be Zn inverse, Wn inverse, and then Zn, Wn, all inverse. And then last will be Z1 inverse, W1 inverse, uh, Z1, W1. And you might say, well, how are these indexes the same? We don't know they're the same length. And I guess we really don't. Maybe one of them should be M. But we could also just pad one of them with copies of the identity until we get them to the same length if we wanted to. That's kind of neither here nor there. Okay. So now we can apply these inverses right here. So apply this and apply this to all of those terms. And that'll leave us with the following. So I've got a bunch of stuff just to copy down. So Xn inverse, Yn inverse, Xn, Yn. And now this inverse will reverse the order of multiplication like we saw over here in our observation. So that'll be Wn inverse, Zn inverse, Wn, Zn then all the way down to W1 inverse, Z1 inverse, W1, Z1. But now notice that everything there is a product of the correct form. We have something inverse, something inverse, the starting term, and then the next term. That's for all of these. Of course, like we change the order over here, but still it's in the correct form form. So everything's okay. That's a product of things inside of this set, which means it's in the subgroup generated, <coughs> which means it's in the subgroup generated of elements of that set. So in other words, this is in G prime. Okay, nice. So we've showed that it's a subgroup. So next up, we need to show that it is normal. Okay, and first let's do this on a generator. And that'll provide us uh, some motivation for how this goes in general. So let's take a little g inside of the whole group, and then we'll take a generator, x inverse y inverse xy, inside of g prime. And recall, in order for this to be normal, we need to, well, we already checked things are normal in this video, but we need to conjugate by an element of the group and end up in the normal subgroup. Okay, so let's do that. We have G and then X inverse, Y inverse, G, X, Y, and then G inverse. And our goal is for that to be inside of G prime. And the way we'll do that is to insert a bunch of copies of the identity. 
So the identity will be inserted here in the form G inverse G. It'll be inserted between these two as G inverse G in between these two as G inverse G as well. Okay, so what does that leave us with? That'll leave us with G X inverse G inverse. So that's from this G X inverse G inverse. And then next we'll have G Y inverse G inverse. So G Y inverse G inverse. And then next we'll have G X G inverse. So G X G inverse. And then next we'll have G Y G inverse. G Y G inverse like that. Okay, so that's looking pretty good, I think. But now we want this to be of the form of a generator over here, but luckily it is. So if we set this equal to Z and this equal to W, then what you'll notice is that this term right here is exactly Z inverse, and this term right here is exactly W inverse. Now we could also write that out as follows. This is the same thing as, g x g inverse all inverse and then here we have g y g inverse all inverse and then times g x g inverse g y g inverse it's kind of the same thing but how did we see this well again by the shoes and socks theorem we reverse the order of multiplication and then we invert everything but this being of the form Z inverse W inverse Z W is exactly what it takes to be inside of G prime. So now we know that generators are fixed under this conjugation. Let's check that for an arbitrary element. So, so far we've shown that if N, which is equal to X inverse Y inverse XY, is a generator of this commutator subgroup, then for all G and G, G and G inverse is inside of G prime. Now we're gonna show this in general for a general element. So let's take some sort of general element inside of G prime, maybe I'll call it A inside of G prime. But then since A is inside of G prime, we can exhibit it as a product of generators. So that means A equals N1, N2, all the way up to NK, where NI is maybe equal to XI inverse yi inverse xi yi. It's a generator like I said. Great, and now let's also notice that for all g in g, we have the following. So g a g inverse is the same thing as g n1 all the way up to n k g inverse. But now we'll slide in a bunch of identities in the form G inverse G. So this is the same thing as G in one G inverse times G in two G inverse all the way up to G in K G inverse. Where, like I said, I slid all these copies of the identity in the form of G inverse G everywhere I needed to. But let's notice that everything here, which I'm underlining in yellow, is a generator and we know that it satisfies the rule that it's inside of G prime. So that's in fact a product of a bunch of terms inside of G prime, which means it is in fact inside of G prime, which is the last thing to show that this is normal. Now that we know that G prime is normal, the logical thing is to form the quotient group. And in fact, we'll do that and show that the quotient group is abelian. Okay, so how can we do this? Well, let's take two arbitrary members of the quotient group. Remember, those will be cosets. So we'll have A, G prime, and B, G prime, inside of G, G prime. Like I said, those are arbitrary members of the quotient group. And now let's multiply them. So we have A, G prime times B, G prime. So by the group operation law within the quotient group, we know that that's equal to A, B, G prime. But now let's recall by coset equality, that's the same thing as A, B times something I'll call N, G prime for all N inside of G prime. 
You can always multiply by something inside of the normal subgroup and you end up with the same cosine. So we've used that you know, several times. So the trick here is to pick the correct thing to multiply by in this commutator subgroup. But luckily, it's kind of just jumping right out at us. It'll be something of this form that will transform AB into, into BA. So that's exactly what we'll do here. So let's set n equal to, let's see, b inverse a inverse b a. We know that that's definitely in g prime because it's of this form right here. So that's going to leave us with a b, b inverse a inverse b a times g prime. But now we'll see that everything that we want cancels. So first of all, this b and b inverse will cancel to the identity. But after those cancel to the identity, this a and this a inverse will be next to each other and they'll cancel and we're left with b a g prime. But then again, using the group rule for the quotient group, that's equal to b g prime a g prime. But that's exactly what we needed for this to be an abelian group. Okay, so the last part of this problem goes as follows. So let's show if n is normal in G such that G mod n is abelian, then G prime is a subgroup of n. In other words, this commutator subgroup is a subgroup of this normal subgroup. It's in some ways like the smallest normal subgroup that produces an abelian quotient group. Okay, so let's see how this might go. So we know this is a subgroup already, so all we have to do is show that it is included as a set inside of N. So we can do that just by chasing elements. So let's take an arbitrary element, I'll call it G inside of G prime, and we'll hopefully end with G inside of N. But now let's notice that since G is inside of G prime, we can write G as X1 inverse, Y1 inverse, X1, Y1, multiplied up to Xn inverse, Yn inverse, Xn, Yn. So using that, that means it's enough to show that the generators of G prime are inside of N. And that's exactly what we'll do. So let's suppose we've got a generator, so that's gonna be of the form X inverse Y inverse X Y inside of G prime. And then we're gonna hopefully show that that's inside of N. And we're gonna do that, well, by using the fact that G mod N is abelian, so we're gonna pass to the quotient group. So let's notice that x inverse, y inverse, x, y, n, that coset can now be factored using the group rule on the quotient group as x inverse n, y inverse n, x n, and y n. But now since g mod n is abelian, we can move things around any way we want, and we'll get x n, x inverse n, y n, y inverse n. Great, but now these two pair off to the identity. These two also pair off to the identity, which means we get the identity in the end inside of the quotient group. But now this coset is equal to the identity coset if and only if this thing is inside of n. That's by coset equality. So this means x inverse, y inverse, x, y is in fact inside of n. So that means we've shown that all the generators of g prime are inside of n, which means that g prime itself is inside of n. Okay, we've got one more. So for the last problem, so the last problem was to reprove the coset equality theorem that was proven in the video and also proven as part of the student's homework, but in a different order to either of those orders. So I think uh, this gives you some real understanding for how to work with cosets. So the order to prove it on the exam goes like this. Let's suppose G is a group, H is a subgroup of G, X and Y are elements of G. Then we wanna prove that the right coset X H inverse 
equals the right coset x h y inverse implies that the left coset x h equals the left coset y h. And then we'll just go around the circle. Okay, so let's do this one first. You know, like I said, okay. So let's go over here. So let's suppose that x h inverse equals x y inverse and that g is an element of x h. So we want to do that because in order to prove that these two are equal, we need to do it with double set containment. So we'll do that by chasing elements. Okay, so if g is an x h, that means that g is equal to x little h for little h in h. But let's see what we're given. We're given something about the right coset h, hx inverse, so we probably want to take inverses. So this tells us that g inverse is equal to h inverse x inverse. That's by the shoes and socks theorem. But let's notice that this is in hx inverse. But then by the given, that's equal to hy inverse. Okay, but that means that g inverse equals little h naught times y inverse for little h naught in h. I already used h, so I'll use h naught here. And now let's just invert things again. So inverting again, we'll see that g equals y times h um, naught inverse, but that's inside of the coset yh. So let's see, what did we do? So starting here and ending here implies that the coset xh is a subset of the coset yh. Okay, so now let's go backwards. So now let's suppose, maybe I'll use a different letter here, that a is inside of yh. Remember, we're trying to show that these two are equal. Now we're starting over here. But let's see. That means that a is equal to y times h1 for h1 inside of h. But now we can invert things, and that'll tell us that a inverse is equal to h1 inverse y1 inverse, sorry, y inverse, again by shoes and socks theorem but that's very clearly inside of h, y inverse, but by our given, that's equal to h, x inverse. But what does that mean? That means that a inverse can be written as h2, x inverse, for h2 inside of h, but now inverting, we get a equals x times h2 inverse, but that's very clearly inside of x, h. So now let's see what we've done. We started here and we ended here, but that's exactly what it takes for the coset yh to be contained inside of the coset xh. But now these two things together, those two subset relationships, give us, give us exactly what we want. We have xh equals yh. Great, and that proves this first arrow. Now let's move on to the second. Now for the second arrow, we wanna start with this coset equality and prove that y is an element of xh. So let's do that. So like I said, we need to start off by supposing that the coset xh is equal to the coset yh. Okay, but what does that tell us? So let's notice that since E, the identity is inside of H. Well, we know H is the subgroup, so we know that the identity is within a subgroup. That tells us that YE, which is equal to Y, so we have Y is equal to YE, is inside of YH, but that's equal to XH. Oh, but now let's just cut out the middle here, and that tells us that Y is inside of XH. Oh, but that's exactly what we wanted to do here. So that one is quite short. Now let's move on to this third one. Okay, so for this third one, we start with this and we want to end here. So let's do that. Let's suppose now that Y is an element of XH. And then since we want to show this containment, we'll start with something inside of XH. So and 
little g is inside of xh. And then we want to end with little g is inside of yh. Okay, so let's see what these two things give us. So this tells us that y is equal to x times h1 for h1 inside of h. That's what it means to be inside of that coset. And then this right here tells us something very similar. So that tells us that g equals x h2, where h2 is inside of that subgroup. And then let's just look over here where we want to end up. xh is a subset of yh, so we want to show that g is inside of yh. So can we get there? Well, I think we can. So let's note that this right here in turn tells us that x is equal to g h2 inverse. Okay, nice. So now we'll use this to solve for x. So this right here will tell us that x is equal to y h1 inverse. Okay, now we're gonna take this equation here in magenta and this equation here in magenta and push them together. So by push them together, I mean we'll rewrite the x in that second equation using this first equation. So that'll tell us that g equals y h1 inverse times h2, but h1 inverse times h2 is inside of h because h is a subgroup, so that makes this whole thing inside of yh. Okay, so now again, starting here, and ending here is exactly what it takes to show that xh is a subset of yh. That means we've proven this arrow. Okay, two more left. Okay, now we're ready for our fourth arrow. So for our fourth arrow, we start with this set containment and we prove that x inverse y is inside of h. Okay, so let's look. Let's suppose that xh is a subset of yh. And then like I said, we want to get here. So how can we do that? Well, let's do something similar to what we did before. Let's notice that E is an element of h that tells us that x is the same thing as x times E, well, the identity, which is an element of xh, which is a subset of yh. So all together, that means that x is an element of yh. But then that means that x equals y times little h for some little h inside of h. But now what can we do from there? Maybe we'll left multiply by y inverse. That will give us y inverse x is equal to h. Oh, but h is inside of h, so that means this is inside of h. That's not exactly what we want here. We don't want y inverse x to be inside of h. We want x inverse y to be inside of h. So all we have to do is invert this. But since subgroups are closed under inversion, that means that we've got it. So x inverse y is inside of h. And here we kind of obviously use the shoes and socks theorem to invert that. Okay, so let's see, we've got one more. So now moving on to this last one, we're going to start by supposing that x inverse y is inside of h and then show that these two right cosets are the same. So like I said, we'll suppose x inverse y is inside of h. And then, like I said, we need these two right cosets to be the same. And we'll do that with you know double set inclusion again. So, and let's take a little g inside of h, x inverse. So starting off with the fact that x inverse y is in h, that allows us to write the following. We have x inverse y equals little h, which is inside of h. And then furthermore over here, since g is in x, h, x inverse, that means that g equals h, maybe not, times x inverse. 
Now, where can we go from there? Keeping in mind where we're trying to go, g to be inside of hy inverse, let's perhaps solve one of these for y. Let's maybe perhaps solve this one right here for x inverse. So solving that for x inverse, we have x inverse is equal to h times y inverse. And now we'll take these two equations that I'm putting purple boxes around and we'll push them together. So let's see, that'll tell us that g is equal to h naught times h times y inverse, but that's gonna be h naught times h times y inverse. But that's something in h times y inverse, so that means that is in the right coset h y inverse. Okay, so now what have we done so far? Well, so far we've showed the containment h x inverse is a subset of h y inverse. And now we need to prove the other containment as well. So let's now suppose that we'll use a different letter. A is inside of H Y inverse. But what does that tell us? That tells us that A is equal to H1 times Y inverse for some H1 inside of H. That's the definition of the right coset again. But now let's see where we're trying to go from there. We're trying to go somewhere fairly similar. Let's now take this and let's solve it for y inverse instead of x inverse. So let's see, we can first write y as xh. That's just left multiplying by x. And then we can invert that to get y inverse equals h inverse x inverse where of course we had to reverse the order of multiplication like we've done you know, probably a dozen times in this walkthrough. So now we're gonna take this brown boxed thing and include it into this brown boxed object for A. So that'll give us A equals H1, and then we'll replace Y inverse with this, so that'll be H inverse X inverse. But now notice h1, h inverse is an element of h because h is a subgroup. That means this is inside the right coset x, h, x inverse. So now, since we started here and ended here, that means we've got the other containment. So in other words, we have h, y inverse is a subset of h, x inverse. Good. But now, that's exactly how you show these two are the same, by showing that they're mutual subsets of each other. So in the end, we have hx inverse is equal to hy inverse. And that finishes this whole thing off. So I hope you guys found this helpful, and that's a good place to stop.